Hello, and welcome to Lecture 3 of Phys 1104, the unit on preliminaries. And in this lecture, we're going to look at significant figures. I'm going to start by making a claim. I'm going to say that my age is 1.372755642075141191 times 10 to the 9 seconds. And my question to you is, do you believe me? So, aside from wondering what sort of nut would tell you their age in seconds, you might start off by thinking, well, okay, how many years is that? Well, if you work it out, it's about 43 years, which perhaps sounds plausible. But I'm going to say there's still something very wrong with my claim, for which reason you shouldn't believe me. If you count digits, then you'll find that the ones place, that two, is right there. So that's the seconds. And every digit after that is telling you fractions of a second. So that if you actually count to the last digit, you see that I've given you my age to the nearest nanosecond. Well, do you really believe I know my age to the nearest nanosecond? I'm sure there's a hospital record in Ottawa with my birth time, but I doubt it's accurate to the nanosecond. So, I've given you too many significant figures. I've told you digits that I have no way of knowing. This is what significant figures are. They're the digits in a number which you actually have reason to know. It's not the number of digits after the decimal, and it's certainly not the number of digits you've written down. And so, digits that you simply don't know, you shouldn't write. But there are also other digits which are placeholder zeros, which tell you how big the number is, but are not actually digits that are important other than establishing the order of magnitude. And some examples will help you see what I mean by that. Look at this first number that I've written, 0 0.03501 seconds. And I'm going to tell you it has five digits after the decimal place. We'll just count them. And there are six digits written down because there's the zero before the decimal place. But it only has four significant figures. Those first zeros are not significant figures. They're placeholder zeros. They're there to tell you that that first digit, the three, is in the one-hundredths of a second place. So they're establishing the order of magnitude. They're not telling us anything about what digits we actually know. And so this is the same as writing 3.501 times 10 to the negative 2 seconds. And if you write it that way, it's clearer that it has four significant figures. Here's another example, this 862,000 kilometers. So the 8, 6, and 2 are certainly sig figs. What about the zeros? Are those placeholder zeros? Well, we don't actually know unless we did the measurement. If we know that we actually measured to the nearest kilometer, and it just happened to come out to a reasonably round number, 862,000, then those are significant figures right out to the last zero. But if we don't actually know it, if we only measured to the nearest thousand kilometers, then those are just placeholder zeros. So this is ambiguous, and you shouldn't write it this way. You should write it using scientific notation, and now you can make clear on the one hand, if you only know the 8, 6, and 2, then only write them. But if you in fact know those other trailing zeros, you can write them in, and they are then clearly sig figs. Significant figures are all about correctly describing the precision of the numbers that we know, and that often comes from the precision of our measurement methods. So, as an example, suppose we're measuring the height of a door frame, and we're just going to use a measuring tape. Now, a measuring tape can be read to the nearest millimeter, and so you can easily get a measurement that should be precise to the nearest millimeter, although measuring the inside of a door frame, you might doubt whether you can actually achieve that. In any case, suppose we just measure once and get 2.234 millimeters. Note, that's to the third decimal place after the meters, and so that is to the nearest millimeter. Well, what does this measurement really mean? It certainly doesn't mean that we think the height is exactly 2.2340000 and so on meters. So, naively, we might say that we believe now that the height is between 2.2335 or 2.2345 meters. So it's within a half a millimeter of what we've quoted. 
And that's good enough if you're doing carpentry, but it's not good enough if you're doing experimental science. As we've just seen, when we make measurements, the number of significant figures in the measurement is set by the precision of our measurement process. And if all we're doing is taking a single measurement, then we can naively say that it's the smallest digit readable on the measurement instrument. Now, that doesn't always work, right? You know if you measure the height of a door with a measuring tape multiple times, you may not come up with quite the same result every time, and so maybe that last digit is not quite as trustworthy as you might hope. But let's go with it for now. So you have a number of known significant figures. The better approach, which we'll see next lecture, is that you do make multiple measurements and you use some simple statistics to figure out what your precision is. But now comes the question. You have a, a set of measurements, and suppose you have to do a calculation from them. So for example, with the door, maybe you've measured both the height and the width, and you're now multiplying them together to get an area of the doorway. Well, the measurements themselves have limited precision. What's the precision of the calculated result? So what we'll see now is how when all you know is a number of significant figures, so you're taking the naive approach where you've just done one measurement and you've got a number of digits that you think you know, how do you propagate that through the calculation? You've likely seen the rules for propagation of sig figs in some other course, but I find many students are a little confused by them, so let's just go over them. Multiplication and division rule is that the number of sig figs of the answer when you multiply or divide should match the number of sig figs of the least precisely known number used in the calculation. The key phrase here is least precisely known. What does that mean? That means the number with the fewest sig figs. So let's do this calculation 3.69 and the calculator says 459.774. Okay, now what? Well, our least precisely known number is here. It only has three sig figs, this one has four, and so we need to round our answer to three sig figs. Everything after that is junk. So we will now round correctly. 459.7 is going to round to 460. And, you know, that's a little unclear, right? Is, is that zero a sig fig? Well, we know it is, but does our reader? So it would be better to write it as 4.60 times 10 to the 2. The addition and subtraction rule is the one where I find students tend to get more confused. So it says that the number of places after the decimal in the answer should match the places in the number with the fewest digits after the decimal. Now notice, we're no longer talking about significant figures. We're talking about places after the decimal. So let's do one. And we can justify it. Think about that, that we're looking at the places after the decimal. Why? Well, if you think about here, this 1807.3 is the one with fewer places after the decimal. Now, if you were just doing this in elementary school or whatever, you would be taught to put zeros here and carry out your subtraction. But remember, the fact that we haven't put digits here doesn't mean they're zero. It means they're, in, they're not significant figures, and so we don't know what these digits are. And so question mark minus six is certainly still question mark. We don't know what it is. So when we carry out that subtraction, we're going to have a... Now, again, the calculator says 1802.724. So I'm going to write that all in. However, we already know that this 24 is garbage we don't actually know those digits, and so we should be writing down 1802.7 as our final answer. We can justify this rule. I've already given you a brief justification, but here's another one. Think about these two numbers, 1807.3 and 4.576. 
If we don't actually know uncertainties in them, then our naive interpretation means that 1807.3 is actually some number between perhaps 1807.25 and 1807.35, and this 4.576 is really supposed to be a number somewhere between 4.5755 and 4.5765. So these are the ranges that we believe these numbers might actually lie in. So what is the range that we believe the subtraction should lie in? Well, the minimum believable is going to come from this one minus the larger one over here, right? And the maximum believable is going to come from this one minus the smaller one, right? So if you actually carry out those two subtractions, what you get is that your minimum believable result is 1802.6735. And your maximum believable result comes out to 18. 2.7745. What does that tell us? Well, in our maximum and minimum, we agree on the 1802. That we know for sure. And then we believe that this next digit is either a 6 or a 7. Well, that means we're not certain about it, but we've narrowed down the options. Now, what about this next digit? It's tempting to say, oh, look, we know it's a 7, but not so fast, because we believe we're in this range from 0.6735 to 0.7745, and so that means anything in there is fine, right? So 0.68 is fine, 0.69 is fine, 0 0.70, 0 0.71, those are all in that range. Well, that means we have no idea what this next digit is. It could be anything. And so we've just justified that the last digit we know anything about is this first digit after the decimal place. And that's exactly what the rule led us to keep as our least significant digit. Let me just very quickly look forward to what we're doing next class. We had this naive interpretation of this door measurement as being between these two numbers. And you could write that this way, where you've written it as a number plus or minus some other quantity that we'll call the uncertainty. But this way of getting it, where you're just assuming that your, say, measuring tape is accurate to the nearest one millimeter, and so you have an uncertainty of half a millimeter, is very naive, and there's a better way to do it. So just to illustrate that, let's suppose you're testing the grand unified theory of doors, and this grand unified theory predicts that the height of this door should be this. Well, does this disagree with the measurement we've made? Since our naive thought is that this is no bigger than 2.2345, that looks perhaps like disagreement. But as we're going to see next lecture, that's not necessarily so. So we've been using this quick and dirty method, but there's, um, if you actually want to make serious comparisons like this, then you have to use some simple statistics to get a proper best estimate and uncertainty, and that's what we're going to see in the next video lecture.